why did I choose this topic? Why paging? Why show a lot of information on small screens? Well, it's kind of like you're solving a, a, a pretty similar problem. You're solving uh, resource, resource constrained environments and you have all this information you have to show to everyone. So why Android paging? So when Google announced this Android paging library, I was like, I got keen about it and I wanted to find out what more pro things they could solve for us. For one, uh, it helped me, one, I didn't want to write SQL and a lot of statements. So one, it, and then also showing things and nice uh, animations, all that stuff was like, cool. That's why I'm sold. Let me see what else can help. So I'm an Android developer and I'm at Carifus, and at Carifus we just build mobile uh, games. So now, some why does paging fit in this? Like we have to show kind of like leaderboards of scores, and that's where the idea of like how can we use the paging library to show this leaderboard, but as well time like try and save our users a lot of data because you don't want to keep on refreshing a lot of this information. And where the origins of paging actually comes from pretty much your typical book. So when you start reading a page, you like you start reading the content on one page and this is a text, you look at things and next thing you know is like, oh wait, I need to continue reading. So what is the indicator that tells you, okay, there's something else to continue paging. Probably it's a page number in Roman numerals or like, whatever it is, it's like, okay, here it is at the corner, so flip the next page. So it means you're actually fetching more data and then and so on and so on, which you kind of like repeat. So pretty much the paging, the book is kind of like the inspiration for the paging library. And what we kind of do and do this in Android is pretty much show information in this kind of like discrete pages. And with these pages, you're like, what you want to do is like show more content as you keep on going. And being on a mobile phone, you are actually really resource constrained because we have seen different screen sizes as well. If you have the latest and big greatest smartphones, you have all the screen real estate you have. But what if you have the small cheapy? You have this small space and you have to be think creatively how to show information to users and how you're gonna keep their attention and let them and keep engaged with your content. So now what is the approach what we wanna do? It's like we wanna show this information. So one, we have to get our information from somewhere. So one, you're gonna get your data from an API. Then two, what are we gonna do with this? Like, we don't know what to just keep it in memory because most phones don't have this capacity to store this. Well, if you can, if you have the money to upgrade, you can. So what we wanna do is we wanna store it uh, locally on the database. Then again, what do we wanna do from that database? Like, it's there in the database, but the user can't do anything without it. So you actually have to get the list of the database and show it to the user. And after that, so what do you have to use it? Like when the user gets to the end of the list, they have to like what? Stay looking at it? No. We probably want to get more information about this. So you kind of have like an indicator saying, okay, there's something else more. So that what you want to do is like show the user the information and then fetch more data. That's pretty much it. And most importantly, you got to repeat it. So now, so what is the Android paging library? So Google announced this uh, com architectural components, which is kind of like the libraries that assist you to build greater and smarter applications. And the paging library actually is part of one of these things. And out of these components, they actually integrate and fit in with other architectural components. For example, Room, which is the on-device kind of database library and live data, which is kind of like an observable data structure that allows you to just observe, but emits data, uh, emits data in streams and you just observe it as a UI, which kind of makes it nice and easy. So you, you don't have to do a lot of callbacks and back and forth between the data. And then it holds the, loads the data in chunks. So like you, when you want to request well, like a few pieces of information, it loads for you, then you continue the next thing. And then it has kind of like four components that make it wholesome to allow you to actually build and get this data from. So we have the page list, which is pretty much the, the content part of it. And you have the page list adapter, which consumes this page list and allows you to now usually show it to the user. And then we have where we get our data source. It could, the data source could be your on offline database or your online uh, API. 
And then we've got this thing called the live page bu builder, which actually allows you to build this live data of your page list and then emit it to the UI and actually just display it to the user. So now, it also works well with the other components, which much have said like room and live data. And then if you're a person who likes a third party libraries like Rx Java and all its many methods, it allows you to integrate pretty well there. So now we have this page list, which is pretty much your collection of data, which you're gonna show to the user. And then it actually loads things in pages. So these are those byte chunk quantities of your data. And most importantly, it does it asynchronously. And then on the pages adapter, it's pretty much does everything what you want to do, the UI, and just consumes the page list and shows it to your recycler view. And we have the data source, and your data source is pretty much where you get your information. But also, we also realize that data is of different kinds, because you have APIs would fetch data from different ways, and different keys and information will show you how to get that information. So out of the data sources, we have kind of like three different data sources. We have the, for, uh, we have data sources that actually show you like, I'm gonna fetch things from a certain position to a certain position, or we have data that actually shows you that I wanna get based on a key, for example, there's a key called next, I wanna get more information. And there's also another one is like item key, so based on where I am here, say position two, I know my next position to fetch is position three, and so on. Uh, and also, all these things are done asynchronously. So, as I mentioned, we have our position of data type, which we know where we are fetching from position n to position n plus one, that so we know what you're gonna fetch. We have a key page, where like for example, you've seen on websites, so like, when I want to get a list of data, then you see there's a next button. So it indicates to you to actually fetch those information. And then we've got the item key source, where it's like, which works well, for example, like if you have a list of comments and each comment has an ID, you know what the next key is, should be like, or example, for a contact list. So if you know you're at the end of contacts with the name of B, you know the next one would be C. And that kind of like the key will be the kind of like the first character of, of the name. So now we have all our data sources. And now these are kind of like the architectures of what the paging library will, will assist you. So we can choose to have fetch our data from the network directly, or we can choose to have a local database, uh, which much interacts with the device only. And technically, you could do that, but most apps don't work in isolation. You're fetching information from somewhere. And the one I actually really like to talk about today is actually using your network and your database together to actually show information and to enable you to have kind of like an offline presence of the network data that you do have. All right, so now this is what the heart of the conversations are all about today. It's like, how do we build this page list and work with the device? And how do we ensure that we have kind of like an offline presence of our, of our data, but also trying to maintain data freshness and how do they all work together? So now, pretty much under the hood, this is pretty much how things work. So on this one side, we have our page list adapter, which is the part of, false part of the UI. And then we have our live data and page list. That's the view model kind of is a life cycle aware uh, data structure that allows you to, whenever you have configuration changes to maintain the, your state. And then you've got a repository because we want our data to be like, uh, have a single source of truth. And then we've got our data layer which is now where we're gonna manage and deal with fetching of the information and how to store it. So in the data layer, we can see we have where our data structure is and how our data source and our data factory will integrate. So, and the boundary callback, which I'll kind of explain very soon. Um, and then the fancy little cloud there is pretty much your API information. So what we want to achieve here is that we want to fetch information from the API, store it in the local database, so the data, local database create, where we can create a data source out of that, which creates a snapshot of the data, which 
we actually feeds it to the data source factory, which actually now creates your data source whenever you need, whenever the data source is invalidated. Push that to the live data page list builder, which creates now your page list and feed it to the UI. And all the UI does is just look at the data, no interaction, anything. So all the changes to it happens magically. So now what we need to do is actually let's get started and show you kind of like basic blocks of what we to get this whole thing started. So now I had a kind of small project I was working on and it's a kind of an evolution of the, uh, the paging library. I started working with it on using offline data by just showing it uh, like a static list of data and fetching from a database and then showing it to the user. But now I extended it to actually now fetch you information from the UI, from the API, store it in the database and then display it to the users. So now let's kind of like build this application. So now we need our data source first thing. So in this app, I'm actually using Room, which is our data source to feed out to our UI. And from here, I'm just fetching uh, a list of all locations. And here in Room, Room contains is all is a uh, positional kind of database because you can have this position indexed and you can say, okay, I am here and I can fetch the next bunch because you know what positions they actually lie in. And then once you have your data source, um, we now need to be put it in a repository, which is now pretty much our single source of truth. So whenever you need to uh, load and upload, so every thing that your lo lo logic layer knows is that I just get information from a repository and does not know of where the data comes from. And here we are actually just creating a, a getting a list of the data sources from the uh, room. And then here in the view model is where we build actually our live data uh, page list. And then we've got this handy little function here to live data. Uh, which also what happening under the hood is that it's building a live uh, live uh, what is sorry live data page list and then once it creates that given a, a different configurations you've got to specify like how many pages you want to fetch how many how many pages to uh, how many data sets to look ahead just in case you want to prefetch and where your page size and then all that it does it builds now your page list and now passes it on to the UI and then in your Page list adapter is pretty much where you set your page list with all the other things. And uh, and also one thing we also need to do is that when you get new data from page list, you also need to know how to deal with uh, changes. For example, if this snapshot of this, let's say you've added a new record and you need to compare between what's been shown to the user and what you fetched and if what the difference is and show the most recent record or not show the most recent record, depending on what you want to do. And this is what the diff callback does. It does all this thing on a separate thread and allows you to actually uh, not lock the UI thread and what it does is comparison. And so the user has a nice uh, look and feel of the application that the application is not hanging. So now, and then pretty much what we do in our UI, in our main activity, we just observe the, we just observe the live data and then it's a, uh, send it to the adapter. Pretty much, that's it. So now, one more step we actually need to do is that we have not actually fetched our information from the API. So what does the A, so what we need to do so the, to get this? So in, in the page list, in the paging library, we have this thing called the boundary callback, which was in the diagram. So what it tells you like, okay, I'm in a data source. I'm like, one, I don't have any data. So what I need to do is like, okay, call the boundary callback. And in the boundary callback, there's a method say on zero items fetched. So meaning that's like, I have nothing. So I wanna trigger an API call there to actually fetch the information for that point. Then also we have other methods that say, okay, we've reached the end of the first, we've loaded the first page, it's stored in the database, I'm already showing that to the user. So what happens next is that I need to fetch the next page. So it's like, okay, there's another method that handles that, pretty much tells you, okay, I'm at the end of the list, uh, call this uh, on, at the end of the list items, and then show that to the user, and fetch the, fetch the data, show the, store in the database, and then show it to the user. 
So pretty much that's kind of like the steps that followed. So now this is what the boundary callback does. So we have this method on zero items loaded, which is pretty much your initial load. So when you create an application, if there's nothing in your database, it will trigger the boundary callback to actually fetch information and then store it. Uh, in this method, I've created like request and save the locations. And then once you've done that, it will display to the user. The user does not need to do anything or callbacks to actually show the information. Just observing, basically observing the information on the data database is actually what you get. Then on the items loaded at the end, pretty much when you get to the end of the list, it now triggers that function and actually does an API call. And it also does it with like fetching the next page to check what page you're actually on. If you have a key there to say, okay, I've had hit the end of my list. So I have already have page, fetched page one, if in case you're using a page key. And then, okay, I need to fetch the next page and so on until you find out you have a stopping condition to say, okay, I've hit the end of the list from the APIs and there's no more information. Okay, cool. So now, where do we have the add boundary callback? So we add it back into the a function where we get locations and just set it to that and that is it. So we have everything, all the moving parts to actually get your, your data in. So now, run the code and voila. True, it'll work. You'll get your data, store it, and show it. But there are a few things that we kind of like forget that when building an application is that we do not want to get that one star review on the Play Store where your users are complaining that my application is doing nothing and I don't know what to do. So we all want to get a good, nice four point something star. And doing this is good enough for just a basic prototype, but there are more things that we actually need to consider uh, when actually doing paging. So for example, uh, we are just like, well, it works, but actually not quite as how we expected it to do. So there's some things missing, and that's true. For one is that, how do we know what the app is doing? Like, so we fetch this data, all these things, but nothing is actually being told to the user, like, okay, I am here, I'm fetching data. So show an empty screen. Uh, nothing to do. Okay, then data appears. Uh, okay, now what do I do with the data? And like, when you get to the end of the list, do you show anything? So it's kind of like, we are missing a loading state that we actually should actually propagate to the user and actually handle these UI changes to show that, okay, when, they use, when there is no actual results from the API, for example. So like, the loading state is like, no results, and you need to show the appropriate UI to the user. Then the next thing is like, um, how else do you know like, if it started to load, or maybe you want to show a loading spinner, if there's a success, you want to show the actual the data. It has all these loading states, so that will take you from using the paging library from okay to better. Then, there's another thing I was like, how do we know if anything has gone wrong? And for example, if, if, you're, if you're not getting information from your API, so like, what do you do? Like the user doesn't know that. If you're not propagating all this information up to the UI layer, you don't really know what you're doing. And so you'll end up with another one star or two star. So you can be frustrated, but also your user will probably punch you know, on this keyboard more glaring than you actually you are. So we want to avoid kind of such in situations where you have, you don't know what to do with this information. So we can actually use live data and actually pass in a kind of like a state of what's going on in the application and propagate it to the UI. And once you have that, it's like you just need to observe it and actually toggle the states of what your application is. So for example, I want to load data so I can show a loading spinner and actually say, okay, I'm loading from the API, you can hold weight. Or maybe, for example, if you're, you want to put placeholders in the list, like kind of like what the Facebook thing showing you that I'm loading some things, then I can show that placeholders. And okay, so the application is doing something that you actually think is not actually doing anything wrong, but it's actually showing I am doing this, so you can just wait or don't wait and continue doing whatever else you want to do. True. So now, the other thing that I realized when you're actually working with this library is that you get the information, you show the page list, and there it is, the data. You actually cannot edit the data. You probably, the only way to do actually is actually Physical, you actually have to change the data in the database 
for it to trigger a refresh. So when you change, a, when you change for example, let's say I'm updating a record in the database, you'd want to, for example, edit it, store in the database, then probably from that, the page, paging library will trigger an update. So whenever there's a write to the database, because there's a query observing that, those, that information, it will trigger the update changes and actually show the relevant UI changes. For example, if it's supposed to move up to the list or move down to the list, and all that is done automatically for you. So other ways that if you have this data, you have to actually consider like, okay, I've updated this data locally, but I need also to let, let the, U, the API know that there's something changed. So what else can you actually do? So that you have this change of you want updated data, and then next thing you need to update your UI, you've updated your UI, you know, but your server does not know. So you probably trigger like a, an asynchronous task, or you're going to trigger a background service to actually deal with these changes automatic uh, for you and fetch the new, new information. But also the other strategies of like, how would you deal with um, updating freshness of the information? So that is a kind of like a challenge. So like, what do you want is a strategy. So if it's data that constantly does not change, and what you could do is pretty much just uh, your strategy is pretty much get that record. You know, if it's the IDs match with it on the API, send it to the API and say, I've updated this record. Friend, notify me that I've updated this record and store it in the database from that. Everything changes will propagate. Or if you're kind of like constantly changing data, for example, uh, like playing a game and a leaderboard, you could be very aggressive of that. When you want, when you load the new leaderboard or like swipe down to refresh, you can just clear the whole local database and it could trigger a refresh for the new content to be fetched from the UI. And these are kind of like things that will take you from having now a great app, a, a good app, to get into better and becoming great. And you consider all these changes along the pipeline. So now, or if you have another case that if it's kind of like information that periodically changes, but you don't really need to see all the things, you can have uh, another architectural component called Work Manager, which will trigger this uh, task will actually fetch the information for you and store in the database. So when you open the application, you've already received the newest and greatest application. For example, let's say, uh, let's say the rankings for the for the men's rugby World Cup. So you see, okay, it's already you know it's updated on Monday. You can trigger um, a, an API call to fetch the information. So when you open the application, it's actually that right there for you. So now we are here. We've dealt with all these strategies. So what is the end game of what we want to achieve here is that we want the page list to expose the data. We want the data, the data source fills in your page list. We data source factory fetch, creates your data source and your page list adapter consumes the page list and the page, live page list uh, consumes that and pushes it to the UI live data exposes whatever you need to do. Like you want to expose your page list, you want to expose your network errors, you want to expo expose your loading state towards the UI. And like that, you will move from having a great uh, okay app and you become paging like a pro, kind of like this guy. So bringing us back to that, it was the beginning of my concept. So we're kind of trying to get back to how paging is all about, like the actual feeling of it. And actually, once you have paged your book, you can actually store it somewhere, come back and fetch it. You don't have to go back to the bookstore and actually get your book. So any questions? So one of the things that, that in, in my environment I'm mm. always worried about is how much Storage space I'm consuming on the device. Do you have a strategy to, to mitigate that? Maybe something that you can run to clean the data? I don't know how sloppy this kind of situation is. That is actually a really good question. So the strategy is actually mostly dependent. So uh, you have a lot of data and you consider, do you want to store it, all of it? Is it relevant for what you need on the device? And if you don't need all that information, you could just store what is 
necessary for you at this point in time and then request so most of the time it actually you rather request as you need instead of just always dumping all this information at this point uh, in the app, uh, into the application because there's a limit to how much it can hold in memory also your device limits how much you can actually store if you have a big bigger device and you have all this processing capacity you can be able to do like store probably in memory 200 records which another device could not so it, it's also as a it's not it's not going to be cross cut across the board that it's going to work everywhere but we were also taking it as a device device uh, case by case basis on devices i hope it answers it no, it's, it's, it's kind of where I am. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's something I can tap into the life cycle to say while I'm scrolling, yeah. just delete some of the old stuff. You could. If, that, if, that, if, what, if you think that you could, for example, if your data you think is not old enough after a certain time delta, and when you're scrolling, you could probably say trigger a delete for that and maybe a refresh for newer records. Or if it's not needed, actually you say okay if these records are older than this date so delete them and then just fetch from this date because also you your data in your data source you can say i want to fetch from this date range or from this range of uh, values and keep on going i'm, I'm, I'm doing the same thing yeah. with the, the live trying yeah. to figure out uh, if this is going to be something that helps me i'm just concerned about the learning curve um it it is a kind of like a slight learning curve but also it how the library is fit and together is it's teaching you also kind of like a new how they presented is a part of introducing a new architectural pattern so how to work with this so you would see generally that presented to you like Oh, you're going to use this library, so you should also use view models, for example. You should use live data. And for example, if you have de developers coming from a different architectural pattern, obviously, like, okay, I have, should I learn this new architectural pattern to be able to use this, or can this actually fit in other patterns? Because you generally you cannot, you, you don't have to use MVVM, uh, which is model view model uh, approach, but you actually can work with. Um, <coughs> The other architectural plans, for example, the MVP, it still works, it works, but obviously you lose the benefit of the lifecycle aware view model. But you, if you choose so, you can may or not make your presenters lifecycle aware, which is probably another headache if you want to go there. But if you can actually start with the library itself in whatever you're actually working in and expand on that. So one thing also I forgot to mention about this library is it's, it's still like growing and still any days. So generally they actually want you to have one type of da data type. But also we realize that when you look at your uh, user interfaces, this, we have multiple data sources that are feeding into the same UI. And like you've got probably an API call you've got here as coming from this point in time. So now you have like how will this library fit into all these things. There are kind of a new funeral libraries that have ex uh, come from this where you actually have expounded on this and actually use uh, the concept of a sealed class where you can contain different data, st uh, data types to actually show, let's say, I have a deal on this soon, it will be part of this, of the UI. You can have um, deals, so this is a special category, and you just, when you're actually inflating it, you actually now switch between the different types. So this is, a, as what they presented as the most simple uh, case, but actually there's much more. So there's, um, I think, a big library by, released by Air, Airbnb called Epoxies, builds very rich UI things. And somehow it, it, I, see, I see this kind of like fitting into it, but I've not actually investigated how, far, how much you can do with this in that case sense. Sure. Cool. Um, so I think we've all done that in this recycling view. Yeah. Um, I joined it right here, so I just want to know, does, does this library have something out of the box to handle those kind of things? Endless recycler view. Yeah. 
that's pretty much the library it does that all and for you you just need to trigger the right uh, method so in the method will be in the let me just go back so uh, yeah so this is what the boundary callback will actually do when you build your page list uh, so you put this in the callback. So when you get to the end of the list, you're like, okay, I need to get new information. So the builder will actually say, okay, call the boundary callback and call this particular method based on where you are. If you're on the first page, uh, it'll call uh, the next method, which is on items loaded at the end because you've already loaded. But if there's nothing already on it, so it'll already it'll trigger. So if the database says, okay, I want to show this user something, but like, there's nothing there. So okay, now I need to trigger the on zero items loaded to actually fetch the information. You're loading like a loading status like that. Yeah. Is that handled in any way by the page library? Or is that a separate concern that's not bound into this? Uh, this is uh, it's actually more separate from this because um, when I was first investigating about this library, because you could just build the whole page list and everything, but then realized very soon that you didn't have a way to actually now send your statuses up to the UI. So pretty much you're gonna have to like observe twice. You observe your page list and observe your live data to actually know what's going on. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Uh,